Showtime. Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Holland. Welcome back, everybody. Hi. This is our first recording after COVID. So here we go. There's some new technology involved, so hopefully that'll all work out for us. Tonight, we're going to revisit the Lost Dutchman Gold Mine. Uh, It's in Arizona. It's in the middle of a desert. Now, several years ago, we had our guests tonight on the show to tell us about their upcoming adventures. Well, they're back with all sorts of finds and brand new info that you're going to want to know about. What they have discovered is nothing short of spectacular. The legend of the Lost Dutchman gold mine begins in the 1800s when a German immigrant by the name of Jacob Waltz discovers, quote unquote, a mother load. Yes, a mother load of gold. Now, this is laid deep in the superstitious mountains. He reveals its location on his deathbed along with maps. And so the adventure begins in a true Indiana Jones fashion. Our guest tonight, Robert Kesselring, retired missile scientist. Yes, indeed, folks. Robert Kesselring's search for treasure began when his aunt gave him Barry Storm's Thunder Gods. Gold. Sorry about that. I got to make this bigger. I told you there'd be some hiccups tonight, but bear with me. I'm also doing it for the first time without my glasses. Maybe it's not a good idea. (laughs) Now, this was a book that can comfort him through his life and would help him weather his time in Vietnam. And thank you for for your service, my friend. Um, Now, after serving in Vietnam, Kessel Green graduated from SMU with a master's degree in electrical engineering and a math minor. He worked for Honeywell, Digital Equipment Company, Rayathon, and within NASA's Redstone Arsenal. And if there's some time, I'd like to go there too tonight, Robert. Throughout his career and into retirement, Kessel Ring maintained his interest in the Superstition Mountains and spent years doing research on the area. It all culminated in a new discovery. Seven years later, he assembled a team in an attempt to prove it. Our second guest tonight is no stranger to night fright. His name is Bill Blackwell. Bill Blackwell grew up in the desert of Palm Springs. He graduated from the University of Colorado and Western State University College of Law. Blackwell spent the majority of his legal career practicing entertainment law in Los Angeles and moved to Nevada near Lake Tahoe. Blackwell learned about the Superstition Mountains and the legend of the Lost Dutchman from his dad, who used to take him treasure hunting when he was a little kid. When he (laughs) came across an article Kesselring published online about his discovery, And Kessel Ring was calling for a pro bono lawyer. He contacted him immediately and jumped on board. Welcome back, guys. It's good to have you back. Nice to be back. It's terrific. Okay. Can, Robert, can you bring us up to date on what's been transpiring in the past few years? Well, let's see. I believe in 2017, we all went in there with a production crew. Is that not right? Isn't that right, Bill? Yeah, that's correct. And Bill had arranged for this producer and uh, director to come out, bring a team, and he brought two teams, actually. We went out. We spent, uh, what, 10 days or was it a week? Ten, we spent 10 days the first time in. Yes. And uh, because we were all a little slow, it took two days to hike in, two days to hike out of those 10 days. So we found some odd things. We found things that they didn't want to publish. And we pursued all the avenues. And I think that that's pretty well settled. And the way it was put to me when I last talked about it with someone in our team, he said, you know, there's only about 10 people on the plant that know what you know now. Don't reveal it. But I can say some things. And when we were in the production crew, we had to split up the teams. And one team went up on top to go look for the mine. They didn't find the mine. They found his powder room. And it was dated and signed. This is Jacob Waltz he's talking about, the powder room. Right. Okay, so now that we know he, his powder room and what he said on his deathbed, we know where everything else was. And so 
surreptitiously, I've had a gentleman that's been going back in there and sending me videos with a GoPro. And yeah, I've seen the gold and I know the hold and that's all I can say about <laughs> burning some bridges. <laughs> I Bill, can tell could you we, uh, can we run to you now just for a second and talk about lust for gold, how that came about? Well, yeah, let, let me uh, let, let me just uh, add on to what Robert was talking about. There was actually, a, a, we actually went in twice. Uh, second time, Robert wasn't able to go in. And I went in with uh, a, my friend, James Sebesma, which who was on the, the first uh, uh, go around. So uh, we went in for another seven days. So we were in there for a total of 17 days. And uh, I'd be remiss to not to mention that the uh, the director of the of the project Lust for Gold was Robert May, um, who's done a number of things, and the producer was Bob Brown, uh, who's also done a lot of stuff in Hollywood. Uh, cult film was Bonneville. He did it, and he did a great documentary on Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> so, also Robert May, if I'm not mistaken, was producer for um, oh the one on McNamara. What yeah, Fog Wars or Fog Years. Fog of yeah, Oscar yeah. winner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so they know what they're doing. And we there was uh, there was about 12. We had about 12 people uh, with crew and cast on it. So, you know, guys running around with, you know, with the boom mics and uh, and uh, three different photographers and uh, we had four trailblazers, and, as I recall, and they were also medics. And one of those guys was yeah. carrying five, an 85 pound pack up to the superstitions and into the Dutchman's area. Yeah, yeah. Those places. So, you know, let's talk about that. You, you I was going to say, let's talk about that. I mean, you just don't jump into a, a, a Land Rover and off you go, right? I mean, you have to carry your stuff with you, including water. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, they had a, a, a technical problem to be able to charge all those cameras and all their mics and everything in time for the next day. And very often we bled into the morning. So we planned, right, Bill? Yeah planned and kind of got it together and we hurried and rushed through everything we could before sunset. So most of our days was still involved in getting to another location and getting back plus shooting. But we had to spend some time finishing up getting those batteries charged. And so they had runners almost every day going all the way back into town and coming back out. Just for everything. I mean, you can name it. <laughs> so, but you were asking how this came together, the lust for gold. And uh, first off, I've got the T-shirt here. It can uh, people can order it online, and uh, the DVD is out on Amazon, uh, so you can uh, pull it up. Lust for gold, race against time. So uh, uh, that's on. Um, they sold it to a distributor, um, and uh, uh, it supposedly is going to come out in December. It may come out on Hulu, but uh, so that's all set. So, um, and people can go on, uh, the, if they go, if they have Facebook, they can go on Facebook, type in lust for gold. Our Facebook page will pop up. You can see the trailer. You can see a lot of about 35 different vi snippets of videos. Um, and they can also go to the documentary from Facebook. I think it costs $4, but, um, so it's getting out there. So, but how it all came together, um, was and we talked about this last time we were on your show uh after i met robert and understood a little bit more about what was going on out there um and and having you know been in the entertainment field uh, as an attorney you know i had told robert i said you know i think this would be make a great documentary and uh bob brown who's a producer i knew and i called him and and uh they put together this uh, in about four months, which is unheard of. So um, I wish I had um, I wish it had taken a little longer because since this documentary has ended, you know, since the last day of shooting and we've been out there a number of other times, we found a lot of other stuff and, and I've learned a lot of stuff and I, things that I didn't know about. Um, and so I wish we had waited a couple of years before we did it, uh, because we would have been able to show a lot more things, but we had a good time. We had a fun time and, and, uh, uh, we, you know, we discovered some stuff and that, that Jacob Waltz, a cave was, uh, was, uh, it was very important to find. And, um, so that's how it all came together. Can you talk about the Jacob Waltz cave, how you found it? Well, let Robert handle that. Sure, that'd uh, be great. 
Remember I mentioned that man with about an 85 pound pack in his 40s? You don't know if there's climbers in your audience, but the climb was about a 5.7. And that means no, you can't do it just walking up. You got to use your hands and your rope or whatever. They went up there. Yeah, they went up there with a drone and a gear and everything. And that's what he was carrying was the drone and the batteries for it. And they searched for the mine, but they didn't know what they were really looking for. And on their way back out, frustrated, they hugged the opposite side of the canyon wall. And when they did, they noticed that the branches of a bush were growing in front of a hole. They entered through it, and when he got inside and brought up the torchlight, there was his signature, and all over the floor was empty powder kegs, antique ones. Holy cow. And it dated, dated so all the way back to the They don't put that in the movie, I don't think, right, Bill? They didn't put it in the movie. No, I don't know why they didn't put it in the movie. I, well, they, uh, yeah, I don't know why they didn't. They, they showed um, us the it, video. It was dated 18, 1865 or 1869? 1869. 1869. Yeah. JW. Right after he moved Holy into the town. Did you take photos of these artifacts and things like that? Well, Were you allowed to? Under control of uh, Robert May. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So was that like a eureka moment for you? Like validation? Well, for the whole finding? team. Yeah, for the whole team. They were looking. I said, guys, the mine will not have any name on it. You can find any mine and anybody can claim it's the mine. But I told them how to find the mine, knowing geology and weathering and what he said he did. And basically, it would be in set into the cliff right at the foot of a cliff. And that cliff is going to catch rain and snowfall over hundreds of years. He capped it, the mine, with logs and dirt. Well, where does that water go? It's going to go downhill and into that mine. It's going to rot them logs. I said, right at the seam of the desert floor in the stone cliff, you're going to find the roof of the mine. It's going to have eroded. And that's what we found. And that's where the gold is. Bill, can you describe the mine, how big it is? When I think of a mine, of course, I always go back to the old fashioned mine with the logs and timbers and things of that nature. Is this more of a cave? Is it 10 feet tall, two feet tall, well, three feet? I have no idea because it because we never entered. No one ever entered it. It uh, all the photographs and everything. You can just see the depressed, the, uh, okay. the depressed dirt there where the logs were rotting and everything which d definitely is an opening, but I, I have no idea how, how big it is or, you know, um, we have, um, there is, there was a group of people from Ohio that also got boots on the ground. They're coming out with a book and, and uh, they got down there apparently, and they took some photographs. They didn't distribute very many, but the first time I saw the photographs, knowing the area, knowing the different, t the, the coloration of those rocks, I uh, you know emailed the guys back and said hey congratulations I, you know I know exactly where you are so um, but we our other associate who went up there with the GoPro and took video um, it looks like it hasn't been disturbed by anybody I don't know whether you might think it has Robert but on my, in, in my here's, untrained here's the key thing that everybody keeps skipping over that led me to it I took an aerial survey yeah two flights and took a photograph right over where you can see all of the clues he names in his, his deathbed. And you can see a square where he had dug down two feet, and put in the dirt and the logs and it is right up against the cliff. And as he said, he had boulders set up on top for a trap to fall on someone that were connected to a chain. Some of the boulders are scattered from the earthquakes, but the point being it was all there. The little cubby hole, the whole works. Now, I had exact GPS coordinates from that. And that's where I sent the guy with the GoPro. And when he got there, he revealed what I knew. This mine was the Spanish mine. It was dug and it was opened and it was being operated by the Spanish and then the Mexicans. Okay. Now, I've... I've just recently started going into what I call micro mosaic maps. And they are the stone maps that they created that have actually surveyor data on them. And the mine is located on that. Okay. So Bill dug it up. I said, over here, 
there's a something under the ground we got to get some kind of a cache somebody left something dig it up two days right two days or was it three that you dug it's two days two days to go down two feet it was cleachy it was totally just froze over and and rock hard from age got down there pull out two maps one of them is carved like a weaver's needle and that stone is totally covered in what i call the micro mosaic technique and it was made by jewelers it's inset with semi-precious stones it's got gold gold symbols everything is on it and it matches exactly what we've got on the maps from the museum as far as the trails and such but this is a snapshot in time it's not what it looked like maybe in 1869 or 1880 or 1980. It is the way it was at the time the stone map was made. Now, looking at all this, I can say that that map shows that mine was in operation. And that's the one Walt says he killed three Mexicans. One of them was the grandson of the survivors of the last massacre. Can you date that for us and put it in a context of what happened there? It was about 1869. He, he shows up out there. He's going to go. He, he spent from 1849 to about 1869 with the Peraltas. He was in the gold rush of the 49ers up in Lynx Creek, all through Arizona. And finally, when the team all broke up, the Peraltas went back to Mexico via Tucson, and he went directly to Phoenix got a mule, got his gear, and went out to where they had been. He knew what was going on. He tried to tell them about it when he was dying. They said, we don't want to hear about the Peraltas. We don't want to hear about the Spanish. The giving proof is that over the top of that mine is about 100 symbols in Spanish code. It tells you what's in it and everything. Now, when they dug this mine, they didn't take the ore that was hard to work at around the mouth. Okay, and they used to make them in a cone so they could ascend and descend on a ladder made out of logs carrying the stuff on their back. So it was a pit mine. He squared it up, blocked it up, covered it, left for good. And at the bottom, he said he left 75000 in gold at $35 an ounce or $20 an ounce, whatever it was then. And as far as I could tell, it's still in there. I don't know what these gentlemen from Ohio found. I congratulate them. But I got to tell you, there's thousands of mines out there, too. But this, the telling proof for me is, number one, it's on a micro mosaic map from the 1700s. Number two, it's the same location. Number three, it's got the Spanish symbols over the top. And he knew about what they were doing. He knew what he was looking for. I believe it was his. But there's not going to be any proof. There's not going to be any signature. But you can see the goal. So the thing that was you say you can see the gold. How do you see the gold? And the other question I have now, most people think this is a hidden treasure. It's not. It's just nuggets from the mine that he was digging out. Is that correct? The actual mine is in existence and it was still alive and it was still good. Right. But it's not bullion. It's not gold bars. Not bullion, Uh, not jewelry. No, it's unprocessed rock. Right. And so you see the gold when you look at the rock. It's right there. It's just, it's studded with nuggets and it's red hematite was studded with red nuggets all along the wall. And above that is all the Spanish coded symbols all along the wall, about that tall, no, really tiny ones, just written all over it. Everything from curses to you name it is on that, that, that map. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, now, let me say this. If the boys in Ohio don't mention the one secret thing I'm not going to talk about. They don't know. They don't know what they're at. They don't know what they're doing. And they may antagonize some people. Once you know this thing, you're going to know why nobody messes with the mine and what the Apaches have been trying to protect. There is a rumor, I hope I'm not blowing anything here, there is a rumor by the Apaches that this hole leads to, let's put it this way, a gateway to hell. Did you guys experience anything out of the norm out there or see anything out of the norm when you were out there? Let's go to Bill for a second and then come back to Robert. No, but you can feel something out there. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm not a real religious individual, but you get out there and you, you you can feel something. Every time I go in, and I've been in there now a number of times, you you there's a feeling out there. Uh, you know, I, I can't explain it. It's just you feel a presence. That's all I can tell you. You know, it, and 
Um, and so uh, that was that was prevalent out there. First time I was out there, I was going, wow, this, you know, <laughs> you know, like people talk about Sedona, Arizona, like that portal and everything. And they, you know, they got so this was the same the, the same feeling um, what uh, what Robert didn't mention also was the um, on the aerial photographs that he took, you could see the foundation of a, a stone house. So uh, which was one of the clues. Correct, Robert? Yes, that's true. And it was the right distance. Mine was the right distance, according to his deathbed testimony and a letter that he had sent to the Peraltos in order to tell them to take the mine over. And and, and that photograph uh, is the first that's ever been published that we know of. I'm sure it's, the first, it's on the back of Robert's book. Um, and when uh, when I contacted the, the group from Ohio, I said, you know, because they were talking about this stone house. I said, well, you, I, hopefully you give Mr. Kesselring uh, props on the first published photograph of this of this uh, stone uh, foundation because they sent a drone up and and took pictures from the drone. So anyway, let me comment about this feeling thing. The micro mosaic maps revealed to me some pretty sophisticated psychology on this part of the Mexicans and the Spanish. At the time these maps were produced, the king of Spain wanted his share of gold, and these maps had to be very accurate so he could forecast how much gold he was going to get to run his navies and all the other operations. Was this King, king Ferdinand V in the believe, 1700s? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Now, um, what they developed on these stone maps that I have found, and Bill revealed they're out at Lake Tahoe, we have another yeah. associate that's Oh, yeah, you, I, we haven't gotten to it yet. what I found up here in Lake Tahoe and, and down the road 85 miles. We Crazy. got three states covered with the same technology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh I want to go God, grab guys. I want to go grab a, a professor out the of whole the whole southwest out of the University we're of Nevada. These boys were educated. Now yeah. the psychology. <laughs> I don't know if you're you're a student, but <laughs> pareidolia is the ability to see animals and figures in vague shapes. Eh, naming the animals of a cloud, faces in tree rings, Jesus and peanut butter, I don't know. But the point is the human mind closes the gap on a lot of little things. And these maps are illustrated and the minds are, and they put in diagrams that are just faint. And I have to do image processing to pull them out. And when I do, they look like they're these diagrams that you see where if you look at the black, you see a vase. If you look at the white, you see two faces. And what they do is they give you the possibility of seeing evil or seeing good. It depends on you what you get out of it. And it's how they control the thieves and no near dwells who are in the area and reading the maps as well. And it's amazing how that you'll just see these two images pop and pop and pop and pop. So I give them an example on Friday night or Saturday night. So this is this is what they've got for power, and they put this all over. So you will walk up on one. The back of your mind is going to say, "Oh, oh, I see this," and your intentions are being fanned into flames. And that's what you're going to end up seeing. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, and it's a test of revelation. And, and Brent, let me explain something here. The, this 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 map that Robert's referring to—that's the um, we what we call the Weaver's Needle map. We found this. This was found 17 miles away from where the Dutchman mine is. Uh, Robert has scanned an area and has said, you know, there appears to be something down there, and it, and actually went out and took <laughs> took some spray paint and made a circle. And I was going out there. He says, dig there. And I dug down two feet. And I hit a capstone. And then about uh, about eight inches down, which is kind of normal to just a square. And kept digging. And then found this this thing that looked like the weaver's needle. Now, I didn't know it was a map. But it looked like weaver's needle. I put it to the side. Dug down some more and found a big triangle, which looked like it had a date on it and put those to the side and gave those to Robert. And he started doing his investigation. 15, 17 miles away from where Weaver's Needle was, it was like divine intervention. You dig a hole and you find this. I mean, Robert could have made this whole 
three feet over to the right, I wouldn't have found it. So uh, it, it, it's it's pretty spectacular stuff. <laughs> this is incredible stuff, guys. Now, and it's out by the, the tomb. It's out by out by where uh, Rick Wynn's tomb was. And well, and, tell and us about say, Rick Wynn and, and, well, and the tomb. Well, yeah, well, sad to say, uh, 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 Rick passed away several months ago. He, he's a pioneer out there, and and if you watch. Less for gold. He's on there at the beginning and at the end, but this was the uh, this was the tomb where uh, he went in and saw gold bars and and twelve skeletons and in in coins and rubies and all. so there his family's out there now. They're 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 working the claim to try and find the to try and find the entrance into this because it was covered over by a big flood. But we, there's there's a uh, there's I've found. 12 triangles out there circling this mine uh, and, um, you know, pointing to it and um, other stuff. So there's something there. And uh, <laughs> unfortunately, we we accidentally destroyed something that was very, uh, I, I think about it every day. It, it was a, a monumental uh, monument that's on a that's on a treasure map. And I'll let Robert explain this, but but we accidentally didn't mean to demolish it as it had been out there for, I don't know, 400 years, 350 years. The Burbage map, right, Robert? Well, Burbage's map was dated 1753 when the Peraltas were originally given the gold fields by the governor of New Spain, really New Mexico. But at that time, it was New Spain. Uh, this is before the purge of the Black Robe Jesuits and they would have been out in force there and rick had said he had found a date on one area 1711. so that gives you an idea that these blinds were in operation about 40 50 years before it was turned over to them on that map is a circle that's been darkened but if you look at it real closely it's filled with triangles okay now when we got there and we looked around, we found all the triangles and all of the measurements that were going to tell us where to go. And we stood there and we said, it's got to be over there. And Rick said, I don't ever go there because there's a lot of rattlesnakes. So we went down there and we checked it out. Not too many rattlesnakes, but I looked at it and I said to Eric, uh, this wall is man-made. And it's a, it's a flood diverter. Something was pushed around the one it flooded. It didn't affect it. We got to go around the other side and see what we get. When we got to the other side, we looked at the rocks. And in front of us was a trap. Across about, what, 12 feet tall, 8 feet wide, made out of boulders, balanced on a skinny little blade, ready to crumble and crush you. And Bill saw that. And he went up there, volunteered cut away all the branches and everything so we could work around it. And we tripped that deadfall because we had children that were going out there and we didn't want anybody to get crushed. When we did that, we found on the black wall behind it, a carved surface that was also a map, the whole thing, over six feet long. Okay, and they had put in the micro mosaic type things. Now, what I'm talking about when I say micro mosaic, I mean, some things are so small, you need a microscope to see them. And they used inks and so forth and paints and ground stone. They surfaced it like it was a church wall before they did this. They carved it so it was the shape of the valley. This map had 3D features carved into it. It was decorated. It had illustrations. It had notes, numbers, the whole work, the whole schmear. That's why it was protected. It was like the Keystone map, right, of that area. At the base of it, for example, was a silhouette of the Superstition Mountains. So we knew that the Spanish knew about the superstitions and that they were both down there and up there, meaning up north and up down south. And at that time, they called them the Mountains of Foam. Okay, and they didn't call them the superstitions. That's an American invention. So the mountains of foam to them was the kind of lava which he's found out there at Lake Tahoe. <laughs> and he sees the same constructs, the same technology, same symbols, same communications. Now, when we took that down, some people found that they couldn't resist rubbing it. 
and some of the surface was worn away. But before they did, I shot a full horde of films on the thing, and I've been able to image process it and resurrect it, as it were, but only on film. Meanwhile, it's kind of worn away. It's been exposed to the elements. But based on what I see, if I ever get a voice, I'll be sharing that with uh, the families of uh, Rick Wynn and try to help them continue what they're trying to pursue. Uh, that's up to them. But the point being that uh, it was amazing how big that map was. And if we had the little one that was found maybe a thousand feet away and buried. And it seems to me that in that camp, they were obsessed with hiding the very secret, very accurate information. And they left laying about memos, is what I call them. You know, hey, we're digging here. Now we find the whole new vein. What do you want to do? And, it, and, it, and, it, and, and that has led us to a couple of dig sites that we have out there. Uh, it, it, it just incredible stuff. <laughs> it's just, but the other thing that we found there was that the, the, on the Burbage, the Mur Burbage map had it was a round, it was a black dot there, it had a, a, like a piece of pie cut out of it and and in a triangle. And out there was this black rock with a pie cut out of it, sitting right there. And we, uh, unfortunately, we picked it up to see if there was something underneath it. I, and it just crumbled. I, and I think about it every day. It, 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 it preys on my mind that we destroyed this thing, you know, and not meaning to, but uh, showing that this was, in fact, where the, uh, the beginning points of the Burbage map is. So anyway. <laughs> How do you come to identify what is a marker and well, what is not? Um, well, let me give well, you an example. Just, yeah, Are there okay, full well, markers out there to fool people as well? Yeah, no. So here, here's what's called a home plate. Okay, wow. you find this, and you're looking at treasure. I mean, it's your your. You can see where the cache site. Now, you you can't see. You may not see the opening, but you know that you are there. Okay, then you got to find it. Uh, you hold it up. Hold it up. Hold it up. Can you see the symbols? The dark and the powdered light. Do you see triangles and arrows? Yes. How close can I get? There's another F. The oh. man over next to it. That's what I'm calling. Now, if you go all the way down to a microscope, you'll find more information. Yeah. I, uh, and, and then, you know, you got the, the and then, you know, you find, you find hearts out oh, there. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, you're, you know, you're on the right, you're on, you're on the right path. You find. What are the things. difference between the two? Okay. The home plate obviously points. It, to the treasure. It, to the treasure. And what does a heart do? Does that signify you found it or? Well, it, it it can it it, it uh, if smaller you get like this means that you're you're close you may be right on it. Uh, there's big ones out there. They say that basically you're in the general area. You're you're going you're going the right way. You're seeing hearts. You're going the right way. The smaller you get, the closer you are. So this was found out there, and it, it's and near right one of our dig sites where <laughs> there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> That's all I can say. Holy so technically, yeah. technically, the thing is that they are um, the mark of the king. You are on land owned by the king. You're leasing the mine for operation, and it's kind of like uh, having a driver's license or, or digging permit by construction because he's going to get audited. And he's going to have to mark them with these hearts, indicating he's part of this one, he's part of that one. So just about everywhere you go, you're going to find these hearts. And uh, you mentioned hearts to most of the people, like in the Dutch Hunters, and they go, hearts, 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 hearts. Because <laughs> it drives them nuts. And, and then you find triangles, which are telling you, pointing you in the direction. So, and the, and the smaller the triangle, I've got ones that are that small, the closer you are to where the treasure is. And there's some out there that are, Two feet, you know, by two feet. So <laughs> anyway, it's a highway. <laughs> of markers. So, so all just, this gold was going it was going back to Spain, obviously. So it was there. How did they divvy it up? I mean, the miners have to be paid. Uh, the owners, the land have to be paid. The king has to be paid. All these people. Um, this must be a real cash cow for Spain, I'm thinking, especially during these times of exploration to pay for the explorations itself. Well, this is really Bill's area of expertise, but I'll speak a few points to raise his mind. 
It was all passed by law, dictated by the king. You had all the bean counters, all the budgeters and everything. It was all down to the penny. Who earned how much an hour? How many can we on the mine? You name it. The whole thing was archi architect did back in Spain and conveyed out to South America, North America. And, and one of the things that, that Rick saw when he entered the tomb, what we call the tomb, was a huge book sitting on a table. And we all think that that's the ledger book um, that they were, because they would, the, the Spanish were meticulous in, in, uh, in record keeping. So um, that's, I, I, I hope they find the entrance one of these days. Um, I think it, we kind of know where it is, but it, getting to it is a different, it is a different thing. Um, but uh, yeah. And the man with the book shows up on one of the stone maps I've sent you a picture on. He's in the books. Is that right? Yeah, wow. he's there. He's holding the book. But it, it looks like there's two views. One could be he's trying to run away and he's all upset, maybe stealing it. Or in another one, he's trying to protect it and move it. And the title on the back of the book is written in gold. Wow. So now, we know the legend's true. Does the landscape change over the years? Is this why they would use rocks in order to identify? Because rocks wouldn't be washed away as much as sand, for example. It is a desert after all. Yeah, they wanted to, if they, uh, so uh, you had the, you had the explorers going out um, that was finding the gold, mining the gold, caching the gold, okay, because they were going to have the extraction teams then come in at some point and and get what they had hidden so the markers this the uh, for the spanish um uh for the most part had to be on stationary objects boulders rocks whatever now i know up in utah uh, th uh, there's a lot of markers up there on aspen trees and this and that and and that's a whole different that's a whole different uh, area of expertise on utah treasure but out out here in arizona You've got stationary objects uh, that uh, that we're going to, you know, last. Well, look how long they've lasted. We're finding things and no one's touched, seen, and you know, 350 years. We found we just found a new site not long ago. Uh, actually, <laughs> Robert's daughter found it. <laughs> there's a there's a there's a six foot red heart. Uh, there is a uh, there's a, a six foot tall horse's head. Uh, that uh, is looking down into a big pond, and um, uh, and I have around that have found one of these uh, and hearts and pointers, all pointing down into this uh, pool type of area. Nobody's touched that. No one's seen that in 350 years. It, 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 Robert had an idea that there was something there, and they went out there and kaboom. Here it was. So we're we this was this is a hot spot now. I'm going to go out there. I, I'm leaving Thursday. Um, Robert's giving a talk uh, to a group of uh, uh, Dutchman uh, hunters uh, at the uh, Dutchman Rendezvous on Saturday night. I'm going to be a sidekick, uh, say a few things, and then I'm camping out there now next week uh, for the sole purpose to try and start a little excavation and you know look around and take more photographs. More photographs you take, the more you find, because you can't see it with your eye. Take the photograph, then you know, then you can see things. So, you know, a couple of things popped to mind. You know how they're sending satellites over uh, South America and they're finding all these lost villages because they can image them now from space. Mm -hmm. I would love to see a satellite go over this part of Arizona and see what they could find you know I, like I, the different I colors of that. <laughs> <laughs> people out there <laughs> <laughs> i want to talk about that too but would there be records either in mexico or perhaps even spain itself of where these mines might be and how lucrative each mine was and you know you said that the spanish were meticulous i'll ask robert um in keeping records would they have kept records that okay mine x was very lucrative but it's mined out but you know what we've got this great other mine that's really producing well records yes but we have to understand how they were pilfered at the time of the war with mexico when santa Ana was in south america and a president of some other little backwards country 
Mexico called him up and said, look, we're having trouble getting this government going. Come up here. He did. And the first thing he did is he dug into the Mexico City's record files, pulled them out, used them as raw material to forge new documents. And one of his purposes was to send a, a man who ended up in jail trying to defraud the United States government claiming he belonged to the family of the Peraltas with a being married to one survivor. And he wanted to have the whole Arizona, New Mexico territory handed to him on a plate. And Santa Ana created the documents from the documents you were looking for. So where, where are the real documents? And I maintain things as they go up the food chain and into Seville, they get kind of like refined. You know, we get too much of this stuff. What are we going to keep? The family kept some of them, but I can tell you what, these micro mosaic maps beat them all because those are um, almost like like coloring book renditions of a mining map. You know, well, you got a little shape here and it looks pretty loosey goosey, you know, and you couldn't you couldn't be exact following it unless you knew what you're looking for. And most people didn't care. It just gave them kind of a vicinity like early American maps. You know, yeah, there's a nut lands out there. That's some Indians and so the same with them, but down at the mining, the, the way the process worked is the prospector went out, he found stuff and he painted black stains on the rock, says, here it is, this is what you got to dig, you know, so forth. I'm going this way. He put it all over anything he found. Mining engineer follows him. He looks at it, he says, okay, we can make money here. We're not going to make money there. We're going to hold that for later. And he puts more marks down. They had four colors for their maps black, white, gray, and red. And it was the color of the lava and the rock that was there too. So they know what the guy's talking about and they leave messages for each other. Now you get done, the mining engineer has a plan and it's written out in those marks on the ground. And the miners show up to work, he says, you, you gotta do this part right over here, whatever this says. And those are what you see in his Lake Tahoe pictures. They go out, the miner team puts those symbols into what they're doing and it directs traffic. It tells you what you're going to mine, who's got what claim, all that information. And then when you're all done, that just sits there, like you said, and it can be seen by satellites, okay, or drones. So when that's all done, the surveyors go back while these guys are working, and they take very measured calculation and record exactly what's been put on the ground. There's an arrow, there's a triangle, there's a home plate, blah, blah, blah. He's got it all, right? And he was responsible, the mining engineer, for traps and also caches, how to hide stuff. So all this ends up on this very accurate map, the micro mosaic map, in which it's got the distances and the directions and everything is exactly where it belongs. It's not like the records that got sent back to Seville. Very deep. They're etched in stone, literally. And they laid, stay at the site. Exactly. And, and Bill, you had mentioned you're going back out there. I hope not by yourself, but you had gone out uh, because I want to reiterate how dangerous this is, folks. They have to bring their water, everything that they're going to eat with them. Yeah. Uh, it's like going to space almost, right? Except for the yeah. air. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, I had an experience. I had search and rescue out there looking for us. Um, Tell me but, that's, that's where I was going. Well, we, we went out there and, and uh, uh, we, we had uh, someone with us that decided he didn't want to go and, and you know, it, uh, part way in. And and um, and so he left, but he, he left with some of the water that we that we were counting on. And um, so, you know, we got out there and, and uh, uh we we took a look at a couple of things but we couldn't stay very long uh, uh, uh because we had no water um, when we did the documentary um they took in um pack horses uh, they had taken equipment they took in some water and those did but it, it, uh, then the, the streams were flowing so we had we had these three guys that were uh, two guys and a girl that were our guides and everything it cooked and everything, whatever. But whenever we'd get to a stream, they'd fill up all the water and, and uh, bags and, and, and uh, um, purify it. OK, so the, the, the two times we went in on the documentary, we had we had water flowing in and I went out there again and rented horses and we took in a bunch of water 
and that was fine. And when we started to run out, then we we came out. We came out earlier than we, than we wanted to. But then we went in again. Which then we we had no horses, <laughs> and uh, and then when the guy took the water, uh, we kind of we kind of had to hightail it out of there. And um, we um, uh, the the one gentleman that is in the navy, um, he had to, he he walked an extra five miles to the parking lot to get water to bring it back to us. And and that evening we had search and rescue out on helicopters looking for us. We didn't know they were looking for us because there were some pictures of some people that had been lost, and we thought they were looking for them. And we turned out all of our lights, <laughs> and they were looking for us. So anyway, we got out. But it, it, you, uh, that's the. Uh, I hope I don't go through that again. You know, I'm I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hear you. And also, <laughs> as was mentioned before, I don't do well with snakes. And apparently yeah. there's snakes out there. Now, well, you, do you have cougars as well, and and mountain lions, and there there are there are some out there, right, Robert? There's there there've been yes, some got, we've got mountain lions, which can have at least four or five feet between footprints. We have jaguars, which are about a third that size, so they're about the size of a German Shepherd. The jaguars are. The uh, that's why you want to have a a, a sidearm of some sort uh, with you. And we have bear. Yeah, that's just that's the top predators. Then you've got all the little ones, the bugs and the birds and all that. But you have to bring your own food too. I mean, you had mentioned yeah. the streams, but there's no fish in the streams. I don't think is there? Oh no, there's no fish out there. No, because it's all dried up. So anyway, but anyway, uh, this has been a great adventure. As I say, it's an Indiana Jones adventure. It's not over with. It's far from over with. Um, we found so. We, from the time that this started, we have brought broadened out and found so many more things uh, at a few other sites. Uh, luckily, those sites were able to get closer to in uh, driving, uh, uh, and um, so you don't have to hike in eight miles. Um, but um, uh, we're going to be and Robert's going to be going out there with me uh, next week for a day or two, uh, take some more photographs, as I said, and uh, explore and and um, uh, do some. Uh, uh, excavation work and just see what we can find. So we may be back here for uh, the the third thing. <laughs> oh, Can't sure, hear. absolutely. Yeah. What <laughs> what type of uh, artifacts have you found? Have you found any just lying in the? Well, with the, most of the stuff we found are markers like this are just lying on top of the ground. Okay, so that that's what we're referring to. Uh, we haven't we really haven't done much digging yet. Um, it's basically been just surveying and making sure we know what we want to do. Um, we have dug over, uh, Rick had his claim with the state uh, at the tomb. And, and so there's been digging there and, and that's on the documentary. You see that on the documentary, uh, and, and that continues today. So two Are different you areas. You got, ground you got survey? Well, What's that? Kind of ground survey. We, we have scanners that could scan down. And that's how Robert was able to find all the gold bars out there in the middle of the superstitions. So, uh, you know, which yet we've yet to be able to bring out and, and uh, you know, there's some government interference with that. But uh, out on the other places that we found is, is Arizona State Trust Land. And that's where the claims have been fi filed with the state. So um, you're dealing with two different entities depending on where uh, you find, uh, you know, where you want to look for treasure. Robert. The uh, two new items, since we like to talk to you, that we find when we go to these places are the following. These symbols that are faded, I've become an expert at extracting them and reading them, and I'm trying to build an actual dictionary of translations based on context and meaning. Then, and also, we got introduced to a young man that's working out there in Colorado and Kansas. OK, and he opened up my eyes. I don't know about Bill, but my eyes jumped out of my head when I started seeing what I call the Sentinels. Now I've sent you a few pictures, but basically imagine uh, you're walking out in the desert and you don't see anything unusual. Walk around a corner, and you see a 20 foot turtle carved out perfect. What do you do if you see a seven foot duck, an eight foot pyramid? I mean, you could you can name names, owls, all these things. And this is back to the influence on the mind. 
you know, the mic, the miners would not try and take some stuff at the time, and so would maybe people that came back when they weren't there. So by 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 putting up these sentinels, figureheads of bears, there are uh, gremlins or whatever you want to call them. You know, those the imaginary figures, right? And we're also finding those, and we never saw them in front of us before. We have eagles, we have bears, we have coyotes, we have ducks, you name it. And this is where we're at now. And I know in the superstitions, Bill's saying them, and he's not too happy about what the what the federal government's doing about that, are you, Bill? No, we had, I sent you a picture, Brenda. There was a, a, a monument that's been out there, I don't know, 400 years. Um, it, it uh, I always looked, I always thought it was a Gila monster face, it's opened. It, and, and it could be a turtle because they would make turtles. But to me, it was like from the Gila River to the Gila, and he knew you were at the you were at the site to start digging. Be it a turtle, be it a Gila monster face, it was eighteen feet high, twelve feet wide. It stuck out. I and I, as I said, I, I sent you a picture to, 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 to you can post that. And when we went out there the last time, obliviated had been blown up by the government. Well, I'm assuming in the government, I don't know who else would be blowing up monuments and and they and they have done this in the past uh, i contacted the uh, uh arizona republic newspaper out there and, and it left a message uh it, it talked to a reporter out there investigative reporter i said hey if you want a story uh, this should be brought out G government doesn't have any they shouldn't be blowing up monuments like this that have been out there for 300 years or so just it's just it's it's terrible so you know they don't want the, the Forest Street Department don't they don't want people going out there to you know to, to look for stuff because they don't like people getting out there and a lot of people have died out there. I, I, I understand that equation, but you don't go out there and start blowing up monuments. Okay, you just don't do that. So um, anyway, that that's something that we, I just discovered last time out there uh, five months ago or whenever it was. That's terrible that they've done that. Now, I want to ask you about the legalities of it. When somebody dives on a salvage um, situation under the sea and they're going down to a ship that has sank, as from what I understand, what they bring back up, they get to keep. Is this the same idea with these mines? Well, it depends oh, on Robert where it is. shakes his head. No, <laughs> <laughs> it depends on where it is. It, okay. If you've got the if you've got the mining claim out on the state trust land. And, and and you filled out all the paperwork and everything. Um, the, the state of, the state of Arizona uh, wants at least five percent of what you find. I, I believe that was the, the figure five percent. Um, I could be wrong on it, but I don't think so. Now, in the superstitions where where we 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 talked about this before, which is on wilderness area, uh, anything you find out there, first of all, they, they, you know they don't want you digging out there. But anything you find basically belongs to the government. Now, I, I will tell you that there were some people that got arrested, found some gold bars, um, and um, uh, uh, and went to and went to federal prison. They didn't go to federal prison because they broke the law about bringing something out of the superstition or digging the hole or whatever. They went to they went to prison because they for tax evasion. They didn't let the IRS know. Blah blah. blah. And and so I had contacted one of the federal prosecutors out there before we did the documentary and he said you know he said mr blackwell i don't care what you bring out of the out of the superstition bring anything out of there you want but if it's treasure report it to the irs pay treasure trove you're not gonna we're not gonna bother you you, you, you just pay the taxes so that's that's kind of how it stands and I, i'm sure that you know if someone wanted to get you know wanted to you know really go at you they probably could but that was that was his. They got that bigger fish to fry. As long as you're paying the taxes, the government just wants the money. Okay. Correct, it's also Robert? a matter of scale. If you find something small, you can walk out with it. You know, a rock, pure gold or something. You find something worth a couple of tons, and people's heads turn all the way back to Spain and Mexico, because you might be talking a billion to nine billion dollars. And they're going to go, whoa, we're going to court for that kind of money. We're going to talk about what was lost. And then you start to hear these things from the Apaches, like it's a war trophy. And, oh, there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff because the superstitions happens to be religious ground for them. 
Okay, I was uh, that I, I was going to ask that question there. next. Yeah, I like this statue. I'm walking out with it. See how far you get. Cultural yeah. heritage, right? Yeah, understood. So you have to be a little bit um, dis not discreet. That's not the word. Um, discern. You have to discern what's a lot, what, what, of, a lot of the stuff. Common we, sense. We found, yeah, well, a lot of the stuff we found out there, we've left alone. It, 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 you know, you, you don't you, really you don't want to disturb stuff. Uh, you know, I there's there's markers out there. I you know you find them. Okay, you, you leave them alone. You know. I find a I find a little heart like this. I'm bringing it out. It's like a, it's to me. It's like an arrowhead. Okay, but um, but there you know there's some things out there that have been, and hopefully the government doesn't go out and 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 blow up some of these other stuffs that that's out there. You know, I, um, last time out there I found a I found a huge bear that I'd never seen before. I taking pictures and then I got home and said, oh my gosh, here's a bear with an owl with a with a tiger. And it's we went we passed by that. I don't know. I went by that set twenty times and camped out overnight right next to it and didn't couldn't see it with my eyes until I got home and saw the pictures and I said, "Wow!" The, so and it's marking something. So next time, if I'm able to get back out there, I'm going to go right to that site and scout around because there's something there. Because they didn't they just wouldn't do that. You know, they're they're telling you something's there. So. <laughs> Anyway. What's the desire? Is the desire for the financial benefits, or is there more than that to it, Robert? Well, absolutely more to it than that. Um, I, I'm not getting anything financial out of this at all, really. Yeah. Uh, I'm spending some money, and, but I'm having the time of my life. Uh, it's the Indiana Jones lifestyle, and uh, yeah, I carry a nine millimeter, and I've had to defend myself, man and animal. So, and, and Bill, for you, uh, same with me. I, I'm telling you, this, it, if if we never if we had never found anything at all, it's been it's just been a great adventure, and I've met great friends with Robert and other people out there, done things that people would dream that dream about doing, things that people would pay money. I mean, I gotta get people to pay me money to take them out to see stuff like this. Um, we, there was a, um, a, a stopping there for a second. Um, Lust for Gold had a sweepstakes. Uh, and the guy won. They put their name in and he, they, they just pulled out the guy's name about two weeks ago or so. Um, I had told the producer I'd be more than happy to trail along and because uh, they were going to take him in. One of the guides was going to take him in and it, it, it retrace the, the, the treads of our steps in. Uh, and so I offered to go along and say, hey, see this? That's what this means. I, I told him I wouldn't tell I wouldn't show where X marks the spot. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that um, the normal person wouldn't, if they looked at it, they still wouldn't know what it meant. I mean, they wouldn't even see it if they looked at it, you know, and so it's so it's good. So it's an educational thing. So I'll see if they want me to go. I'm more than happy to go. I'd like to go back in with some people. Uh, you know, you don't want to go out there by yourself. So yeah, the real but, shot is we both have learned a whole lot about how they stored information to be retrieved. And unless you know how to read, when you look at a book, it's just a thing. But when you can read the letters, it's a something. And that's what we're both going through is that's not just a rock. That's a message. The rocks that he's holding up, if I image process them, I'll pull the hidden writing right out of it. And you, if you understand Spanish and you know the code, you get the message. Bob's your uncle, pun intended. <laughs> but right, anyway, th thanks for having us here tonight. Uh, Thank for, you. I was going to say we, we should start wrapping up now. Any final words, Robert? And then we'll go to Bill. Well, certainly glad to see you again. And thank you for it's having me. Great to see you. Um, everything's okay with COVID? You made it through okay? Uh, yeah, my uh, daughter is here with her husband and the baby of six months, and they all three had COVID. Oh, man. And Are they, they all right got, now? They got yeah. They got called to get their shots just a little bit too late. Okay. I'm so we're we're doing good. Well, I'm Everybody's glad everybody's good. okay. In the end, yeah. Terrible yep. times. Terrible times. Listen, it's great to be back, Bill. Any final words, my friend? Yeah. No, I'm just I, I'm so happy that it's winter because I'm going to be able to now go out there. I'm you know right. and go out. At, I just bought a camper. I just bought a truck with a camper yeah. shell. I'm headed out uh, two weeks at a time so I can just 
stay there and camp and and walk around. There's so there's, you know it, it's a big area, uh, and there's it, there's things that we've seen with uh, um, uh, long distance uh, taking long distance. Uh, shots and everything that we haven't even had a chance to walk across the valley floor to go look at these things. So I'm going to have the time of my life here over the next two weeks, just walking around and and looking at different new areas and and photo taking photographs and sending them to Robert and uh, so that he has to stay up all night trying to understand what's on these photographs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I get a whole lot out of it. Don't keep it up. Yeah, you have an open invitation anytime. Yeah. Yeah, and Thank if you'd you ever so if you'd ever get out here to uh, Southern California or or, or Lake Tahoe or uh, or uh, or uh, Scottsdale, uh, Brent, we'll take you out there. <laughs> I'd love to go. I would yeah. absolutely love to go. Now that things are easing up a bit and the borders open, the Canadian American border border folks, um, we, 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 could do, we could do something live on location. <laughs> that would be fabulous, wouldn't that be great? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good folks Robert Kesselring Bill Blackwell the lost Dutchman gold mine seems like we're finding more and more of it and there's lots of caches of different various minerals out there and uh, there he goes he holds up the heart Arts galore. <laughs> Arts galore. thank you both so much for coming back on the show it's good to be back folks it's good to see you all hope everything's well at home with you all I am Brent Holland we'll see you all later bye